Hi, this is a Conversations with Creatives podcast for Opus, and you're listening to episode two of The Power of Art, Imagining Endless Possibilities. Our world is changing rapidly. When we look back at where our heads were even a year ago, there's no comparison to where we are today. The pace of transformation is so fast, we're arguably still playing catch up. But art offers us a unique space to navigate transitions, one immersed in thoughts, feelings, and imagination. It evokes emotions and holds a mirror up to our times, allowing us to reimagine new futures and make our world a better place. In episode one, two talented printmakers, Kari Christensen and Lee James Abbott, discussed how they got into the right headspace to create and what they drew from the deeper, more parallel realms of reality. This time, I'm delighted to be chatting more on the subject with Levi Nelson and Lauren Brevner. Currently completing his graduate degree at Columbia University School of the Arts, Levi Nelson is already one of the most celebrated indigenous artists in the country and the recipient of numerous awards. Employing oil painting and mixed media, his work is part of the permanent collections of the Oden Art Museum Whistler and the VGH and UBC Hospital Foundation Art Collection, plus scores of important private collections in the Lower Mainland and across Canada. As well as discussing how Indigenous futurisms informs his approach to reimagination, he provides some useful tips for kick-starting the creative process. My name is Levi Nelson, and I am from the Leelat Nation in British Columbia. I am a visual artist, a painter, and I recently took up an interest in printmaking and mixed media work. I like to uh, incorporate contemporary Indigenous art, uh, art of the Northwest Coast, Coast Salish, images from the uh, uh, pictographs from the Stallion Territory, and kind of mashed those up with uh, iconography from pop culture as well. Indigenous Futurisms comes from Dr. Grace Dillon of Portland State University. She is the uh, professor of Indigenous Studies, and she wrote a book and introduced and coined the term Indigenous Futurisms, which comes after Afrofuturisms. I guess for her, she, as a thought experiment, is encouraging Indigenous people and, and others to think about our place like far into the future as Indigenous people, as a way to escape the harsh realities of our past, of uh, colonialism, or even the current state of affairs for Indigenous people um, as we're still colonized. And um, it's a way to to open up, I feel, I've, I've used it as a way to open up my art, as a way to, to push it forward, uh, to use unconventional colors, to mix it with, um, with like say, you know, Sitting Bull being on the same surface as Snow White or, uh, you know, Northwest Coast shapes mixed with uh, like techno colors of like fluorescent pinks and greens or purples. If you think about indigenous art, a lot of it can be pigeonholed or even, you know, just sort of pushed into the native art gallery or, you know, gift shops of that, like native gift shops at, at like at, at museums, like the Museum of Anthropology or the Squamish Lua Cultural Center. And I, I, for me, I think that indigenous futurisms, it opens up this whole new world of, of indigenous artists and our art to exist on the same walls and in the same room as contemporary artists, uh, Western art as well, and not just, you know, pushed to the side to be in specific shows or uh, specific galleries. I address harsh past realities through my work by way of imagery and even sometimes text. I recently did a print called The Ghost of Sitting Bull. It's an image made up of uh, photo transfer 
silkscreen and monotype collage on paper, but it's it has the it has like the, this uh, article that I found from the De- Detroit Free Press about the day that Sitting Bull was killed, and I've also on that same surface have a Pepsi Cola logo um, back when it was only five cents as a way to think about um, Pepsi Cola as a, as an American icon and as well as uh, Sitting Bull. And I feel that putting these two different or contrasting icons on the same surface open up a conversation. When you think about how Indigenous people are presented in the media, it's a very narrow view. And I don't think that's a mistake. It's really sort of twisted to me. I didn't realize that I grew up in segregation until I moved to New York back in August of this year, 2021. I landed in New York and I came to the astonishing realization that, wow, okay, Indian reservations where I grew up in my community is, it's segregation. And that realization really kind of spurned this um, series called Good Old Government Housing and made me focus on the current harsh realities of what we're living in being colonized. And I was thinking about that this morning about how polite Canada and uh, the sort of uh, optics that Canada gives off as as being this very open-minded and generous and, uh, you know, accepting of of immigrants and, and, um, yet there's this really dark underbelly of how they treat the indigenous people of this country. And that really fuels a lot of my work. I think I've always, when it comes to my practice, I feel like I'm always in the mind space of an artist. Um, I don't know where that drive or ambition comes from, but it's just there. When I wake up in the morning, you know, the first thing I do is I might scroll through Instagram and a lot of the pages I follow are um, pages of like of, uh, the Tate Modern or the Museum of Modern Art or, you know, other of my peers pages and just seeing paintings and, uh, you know, maybe I'll wake up and I'll watch a documentary about Um, Let's see, the other day I watched a documentary about Francis Bacon. But I get a lot of inspiration, you know, from just looking at the work of other artists. And that, like, I, or even visiting an art gallery, I get really antsy when I'm in an art gallery because I find them so inspiring. I went to this Philip Gustin show and just to see the the textures of his paint and the, the butteriness of on, on the surface and the sheer size of those large paintings, um, I, I immediately wanted to return to my studio and just slap around some paint in a very fun way. I don't carry around a sketchbook, but I do have a list that I'll write down. I have, you know, just a tiny little notepad that I'll bring with me to the, to an art gallery or to a museum. And because the work is so inspiring, it'll make me think about my current practice or the process that I'm in. And, and I'll write down like a little phrase or of, of an idea, um, which, you know, I'll jot down in my phone and I could even share a few of those, uh, with you right now. Um, I've just got a list called uh, Art Ideas. Like, uh, here's some here's some phrases from my list. Water spirits, octopus and jellyfish, lightning water, blues, purples, uh, trickster, wily coyote, vintage Thunderbird car, spray painted Northwest Coast Thunderbird on car, drawings and coloring, white Disney princess, native, brown, white BIPOC Barbie diorama. These uh, I'll just kind of refer to, uh, especially when I'm thinking about a new painting or uh, a mixed media work. I'll do a pencil sketch, usually for an oil painting. But when it comes to like a mixed media work, which usually involves like acrylic, silk screen and collage on canvas, 
um, I will work more uh, spontaneously and just you know, slap an image down and then see where that leads to next. When I wake up with my mind racing and I'm sort of not grounded and I'm, you know, maybe tripping over myself with all of these different thoughts that are jumbled together. I, if I read a couple chapters of a book, it really helps to focus my ideas. Or if I have an idea, then I might think about uh, accessing a certain article that might articulate those ideas a bit more because it, when they're in my head, they, they remain a lot more abstract and all over the place. But if I'll, you know, pick up uh, an essay in in an art catalog, I find those to be very um, grounding. I feel that when we think about culture, not just indigenous culture, but our human society in general, if we look at history and think about, you know, ancient Egypt or um, the art of Haida Gwaii of the Northwest Coast, or, you know, walking through any museum and the works that we encounter in these walls behind the glass, those were all created by artists and they help shape our world as we see it today. Even the buildings and the rooms that we live in, the cars that we drive, the apps that we use, these are all made through the mind of an artist, of a creative individual. And so art has an impact on our everyday lives and to a degree that we don't necessarily notice all the time. And I, I think that's just a beautiful thing to think about. In a way, artists quite literally design culture art changes the world artists present ideas and images whether in film whether in paintings they cause people to think and creating these images have an impact on on people and help shape the way we think about the world around us because when it, when it comes to to being an artist, I think one of the motivations is that we want to create a world the way we see it. We want to surround ourselves um, not only in beauty, but in, in, in the idea that we might have about the way a just society might be. That's, that comes from me. I, I feel there's a lot of uh, inequality that I like to address in my work, but at the same time, I also want the work to be interesting. It has to look and be intriguing in a way and not just didactic or, or preachy, but it has to, it has to look good on a wall, <laughs> not just in a decorative sense, but it, I think art from my, in my opinion, should have a message and a meaning behind it. It reminds me of this quote that I, came across that said, if you could imagine a better future for yourself and for your people, that is already the beginnings of that future being constructed. And to me, the way I believe that reality takes place, I think our imagination and the way we think about life or our future, that definitely has an influence in how it unfolds. Lauren Brevner is a multidisciplinary artist whose work, deeply inspired by her Japanese Trinidadian heritage, combines traditional approaches to portrait painting with themes of cultural identity and female representation. It has been featured across multiple platforms, including exhibitions, civic projects, print publications, and most recently the Vancouver Art Gallery. On top of offering insight on how to get into the headspace to create, Lauren discusses how she blends traditional techniques with more surreal elements to transport the viewer and depict a reimagined, inspired and empowered view of femininity. My name is Lauren Brevner and I am a portrait painter. Um, I mainly paint portraits of women. I do illustration work as well from time to time, editorial work. 
And I also have a collaborative practice with my partner, James Harry, and we paint murals kind of all over the place as well. I have a couple of tricks, like my go-to tricks. If I'm really struggling to kind of find inspiration or be creative, I have um, this particular scent that I will put in my studio to kind of trick myself into getting into that space. It's by time, it's called Kimono Rose. I don't know, I bought it when I was like, just learning how to teach myself how to paint. And I guess I just was really into the scent at that time. And now it's not like my favorite scent, but it just takes me there immediately. And it's almost like a nostalgia smell now. So it kind of, it brings me back to like the love of painting, the passion that I had when I first started, which is really hard to hold on to. It snaps me back into that like excitement of like, yeah, the early, kind of 2010s just getting started with my career and how much love I had for painting whereas now it's more of a job so it can be a bit more of a struggle at this point. <laughs> I also like to listen like if I'm working on a show for example or one specific body of work I'll listen to the same album on repeat over and over again so like I've been listening to a lot of Coldplay recently <laughs> again and I find that just it kind of brings me back to that space of creation or whatever I was thinking of or inspired by at that time. I tend to like listen to a lot of music when I work and so having that repetitive sound kind of like psychs me back into that certain space. So yeah, kind of any sensory, um, anything I can do to like activate the senses, I find that puts me in a certain space to create. So smell and sound. I do find that um, how I used to get my inspiration was those times of social interaction and leaving the studio to kind of refresh and now that you don't have that you do realize like how much time you do spend alone how much you need that social time to like yeah recharge like you need to step away from the studio and just like anyone else you can't be working you know 100 hours a week <laughs> and because our studios are in our living spaces and because we live together it's like it can get really mixed up <laughs> the lines get blurred very easily so like drawing those lines making sure we're taking time off is a big thing making sure we're like going for walks and leaving the house and having some semblance of a schedule because yeah we are our own bosses so not you know it can't be super loose when you're doing this full time as a career you have to set boundaries for yourself and i found that was super helpful i get asked like do you need to be happy to produce work or do you like to be more sad because some of the portraits can convey that kind of emotion i personally like i like to be in a joyful space entering the studio i, I can't work if i'm like really upset or really depressed um and i think having that joy allows me to access those different parts of kind of emotions that i play with um and yeah i guess it is the responsibility of the artists, but at the same time, it depends on what you're trying to convey through your painting. So um, I always consider myself less of a portrait painter and more just, I'm just trying to paint emotion, I guess, and I want to pull and evoke an emotional response through portraits. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's um, putting anything on the viewer when they're looking at my pieces, but yeah, I personally have to be in a good headspace in order to produce. If I'm not, then not a lot happens in the studio, I find. It's it's constantly evolving, but I basically am in a space now where I work primarily in oils for the actual portrait, so the face itself. And then everything else is a mixture between collage and um, I work with a lot of metal leaves. So I'll work with gold leaf, copper leaf, silver leaf, a lot of oxidizing those leaves and chemical treatments. And, um, and yeah, it's really just a blend. I think that coming myself being mixed it kind of leaked into my work i like to blend things and i like to mix things and i like to i like to just yeah take things that maybe don't fit together even like pattern clashing and try to make it work i guess that's kind of representative of how i feel being japanese black and german and just kind of making this whole mixture work somehow and especially in canada there's a lot of mixed people um and i always felt like i didn't really have I didn't really belong in any one place. And so I think these are like kind of, yeah, emotional self portraits, I guess. I'm just trying to represent the mixed female and how I feel as a mixed female and kind of put that into my portraits.
I think tapping into some form of surrealism in whatever that in whatever way the artist finds, because there's a, definitely a spectrum. Um, I I personally like I don't I don't tend to gravitate towards hyper realistic work, and that's only because like that is the everyday that we live in. I think having that surrealist element kind of gives you that escapism that I personally look through or look for in art. And I want to be taken away. I want to be transported into some other space, especially in the time of COVID and all of the just, yeah, we're all going through it right now. And so just having that escape, escapism in any way, shape or form, I think the surrealist elements help us do that, which is also why I don't like to paint real people specifically. I'm not, I don't have people sit for my work. Like I kind of make up their features and I'm not trying to portray a woman sitting in a room. I'm trying to portray this kind of, yeah, surrealistic kind of escape moment <laughs> in these portraits. Like my dream version of the beauty of a female, I guess. For me personally, I've never been one for words. I'm not good at writing. I'm not the best speaker, um, but that's how I personally portray how I'm feeling, my emotions. And I think that is the power of art, the whole, you know, picture can paint a thousand words or, I don't know, that's probably wrong. <laughs> I don't even know, but yeah, I just think that it's just a different way to convey how you're feeling and to connect with different people and as an emotional escape that we all need so badly. Red is my favorite color. Um, and I think if you look at my body of work, there's red in basically every piece that I've done. Um, I just love warm tones, even like the, my base flesh tone is a mixture of like cadmium red, cad yellow, a tiny bit of blue, but it's heavily red based. And so all of my flesh tones are quite warm. And so when I'm color matching for the rest of the composition, it has to kind of tend to the warm side. So basically everything starts with a warm red and then gets built around that. So there's heavy significance there for me. I just, it's just, again, the emotional aspect. I feel like I like a warmer tone. It feels like a hug <laughs> almost. Like I enjoy that feeling and I want to convey that feeling. So I think warmth does that. Cool tones don't do it quite as much for me. And even if I'm working in like a monochromatic palette, I still add a warm base under. Um, and yeah, like in Japanese culture, red is very um, significant. And I've just always loved the color. <laughs> I guess it totally depends on the person, but like, I love that it can convey beauty, but also strength. And I think that's where a lot of my portraiture comes in. I like to portray a very strong female. Um, I'm not one for the damsel in distress look. Like, there's not a ton of, you know, expression going on in the face, but you can tell by the eyes that there's thought there <laughs> and there's passion there. And um, I think throughout my work, the main thing is like the way females have been represented throughout history have been more of like a voyeuristic type thing painted from the male gaze usually nude um unaware that they're in this whatever surreal setting um and yeah i just i kind of wanted to like reclaim the female portrait as one that is not helpless and i think red is like the perfect like kind of flag color for <laughs> for that kind of um yeah what I'm trying to do I think we are we ha we run the gamut of the things we can do women are amazing we are so much superior <laughs> to men. It's like just the capacity that we do motherhood like everything we really go through it and I think red is like the perfect color to kind of convey that men are awesome too but I'm just saying we uh we can get a lot done <laughs> I'd like to thank both Lauren and Levi for catching up with me, as well as Lee and Carrie in episode one. I hope this exploration around imagining endless possibilities has provided you with some inspiration for your own creations. Next month, we'll continue to delve deeper into the power of art by putting our vision into practice. Please tune in. Until then, thanks for listening.